This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode. Rudy Flush throws it down. Well, Hell Flutie, that was the play that we still see to this day, one of the greatest plays in college football history. We go back and watch that for this episode of Distant Replay, and we learned a lot along the way, by the way. This is a great game, outstanding game, probably the first game that we've done that is really kind of a meaningless game. Regular season matchup, it's not our first regular season matchup, but it is one that really didn't mean anything for the rest of the season, but it was a primetime matchup between, between two great quarterbacks, and we're going to dive into that game today. It's miami Boston College from 1984. I'm Ben George alongside Mike Noto. Mike, how are we? Doing great, Ben. And I was pleasantly surprised in this game about how this game was a lot more exciting than just that one play. And like you mentioned, these two teams were already slated for their bowl games. Yeah. Right? Miami Miami uh, would go on to play in the Fiesta Bowl, uh, Boston College in the Cotton Bowl. But it didn't take away from how exciting this game was. And again, it was a pleasant surprise uh, when when I started watching it and, and went through the game. Yeah, so we're going to start that in just a second. Let me remind you first, YouTube. Thanks, everybody that's uh, subscribed on YouTube. A lot of new uh, listens on YouTube over the past couple of weeks. So we appreciate you guys. But find us there as well. Every episode's archived there. Plus on our website, distantreplaypodcast.com and on Twitter at Distant Podcast. So let me just start with one of the thoughts you just had there, Mike. This game... We, what we see this highlight, I mean, all the time, right? Flutie's long throw kind of in the muck uh, against Boston College. But the one thing I don't think I ever really realized or really paid attention to is this was a really good game, a very high-scoring game. And this capped off really what was a back-and-forth battle, uh, something we would be more uh, common to see today than that era. Yeah, it made you feel like you were watching a game from present day back in 1984. And, you know... You know, they went through um, uh, Flutie and his pursuit uh, for the for the career passing yards milestone here. And obviously, you know, I had known Flutie was a good quarterback. I had known Miami was obviously good back then. But to go back and see how the parallels between the offenses now and the offenses then, and unfortunately, these two defenses look like Big 12 defenses out there. <laughs> well, this game took place November 23rd, 1984. It's the day after Thanksgiving. Didn't realize what point of the season. I, I think I even might have thought this was a bowl game for all these years. I don't. Even, I'm not even sure where I thought this game uh, happened over the course of the season. But to kind of give you some perspective on where we are, you mentioned Flutie going for the passing record. He was trying to surpass 10,000 passing yards for the first time in college football history. Yes, it, it might sound foreign right now. It did to me at the time. I said 10,000 yards is the record. Number one, I'm impressed that Flutie was the first one to get there. I didn't realize that. I thought with all the quarterbacks that came before him. I thought for sure somebody had reached that plateau before he did. But then I went back and looked. Do you, do you have any idea where that would rank right now, Mike, on the, on the college football passing I list? Don't, I know what the current record is. The current record is over 19,000 by Case Keenum, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it is. And that's and, all I know. I don't know where Flutie ranks. I, I, I don't even know exactly where he ranks either because the one list that I found, and I, I couldn't go back very far, it had 37 players listed. Wow. 37th on the list was twelve over 12,000 yards. So just to give you some context, I, he's probably not even in the, he might not even be in the top 100 now, to be honest with you. I, I don't know exactly where that stands, but with guys, I mean, guys are easily getting 35, 4,500 yards um, a season. So what he was able to accomplish is, is pretty impressive, but it shows you what kind of era we we're talking about back then. There wasn't a whole lot of, of passing. There was very balanced offenses, and we saw it in this one. I mean, look, Joe Burrow threw for 5,600 yards last year, Mike. Okay, for LSU, yeah. just to yeah. give you some context. So uh, that that's that was the first thing that I was I was really surprised about uh, 
how big this game was and also with Flutie. Uh, the other thing on the other side, Miami, this was Jimmy Johnson's first year uh, on the sidelines for Miami, taking over for Howard Schnellenberger. And he took over a team that just won a national championship. And I kind of got the sense like this team during this game where they were talking about it was kind of a letdown. Um, you you would have thought this team wasn't even ranked based on kind of this, the conversations we were have, tough season for Jimmy Johnson so far, yada, yada, yada. But this team was still really good. Yeah, they're still really good. So they came into this game with three losses already. And something the announcers made note of was that they made note of several times was that they're coming off a loss to Maryland the week before, uh, a couple weeks before, where they were up 31 nothing and ended up Jeez. losing the game to Maryland. And that was, I looked into it a little bit more, sort of put two and two together. That was the famous college game where Frank Reich threw six touchdown passes in the second half, foreshadowing to what he'd do in the second half of the Bills Oilers AFC divisional round game as a pro. Nice. So that when, when Frank Reich has ever talked about uh, this day and age as a player, it's that it's that Miami Maryland game and that Bills Oilers game that people brought up. So I just thought that was an interesting uh, little note to this game as well. And the announcers even pointed out how Miami was a little bit sluggish early on, but then you know they, you know, like you said, that's a good three win team that Miami had. Yeah, it was a good team. Three lost, three lost team, rather. And you wouldn't even know it because of this this time, I, I guess, was common across the board. But for broadcast, they didn't put the rankings up on uh, the graphics with their with their matchup. So you know, you might look at this now and turn it on and say, okay, this was two unranked teams, but it was actually number ten versus number twelve, uh, which was <laughs> pretty surprising to me uh, that that. The, the, the rankings were this high, but Miami played a tough schedule that year. And you mentioned the Maryland. They opened up uh, against number one Auburn that season. They ended up playing seven ranked teams throughout the year. So they had a really, really brutal schedule and just had a lot of tough losses like uh, they would suffer in this game. But as we know, they would go on to be a, a pretty good team as well. So uh, that was the, the the kind of the big preview. Anything else pregame stuff, Mike, that uh, we need to add before we get into the broadcast itself? Just the weather. You could tell the weather right when you right when the you know the 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 broadcast came on. The weather would be an issue throughout this entire game, uh, more for the defenses than the offenses, as we'll get to. But a rainy, windy South Florida day. Yeah, no doubt. Well, this game was on CBS. Obviously, CBS was one of the major uh, college football broadcasters of the time, and it was our big our pal Brent Musburger who seems to find himself into all these situations. But he was alongside Eric Parsegan and Pat Hayden, which was a pretty interesting uh, trio because, I mean, these are those are two guys that I don't think about at all in terms of TV. I mean, Parsegan, the great Notre Dame head coach, Pat Hayden, who was most recently USC's athletic director. But put them all together, this is a pretty good broadcast team. Yeah, it was actually a pleasantly surprise. You know, what I thought was unique was how – from the beginning of the game, it was Musburger play-by-play, Parsegian talking about the defense, Hayden talking about the offense. Yeah. And they kept to those roles the entire game, and they even talked about those roles, about how Parsegian was joking around trying to have to find good things to say about the defenses in this game. <laughs> Pat Hayden, like you mentioned, most recently the USC AD, he was also the Notre Dame analyst for yeah. a time there um, earlier on, earlier on in the decade. And uh, he was he was good with Notre Dame as well. So again, and obviously Musburger is a legend. I didn't hear any subtle mentions of the gambling spread or the over under though. Did you? Yeah, actually, I mean, very very minuscule mention. But he did say <laughs> right before kickoff, Miami is favored in this game. So he didn't he didn't get <laughs> yeah. any point spread or total, but he did reference it. I'll tell you, one of my favorite moments watching college football was when Musburger said during a broadcast one time, the underdog is howling tonight. That's like one of my favorite <laughs> moments watching college football. I love it. It is. It's awesome. Uh, that's funny. So that's pretty So CBS, good coverage overall. We're going to put the link on our website, distantreplaypodcast.com. It's actually broken up into four parts, and it's the, uh, the South Florida local affiliate of CBS broadcasting this with commercials and everything. Should we jump into outdated right off the bat, Mike? Because there was a lot to cover there. Should we? Say there was this? a lot to cover. The outdated between the commercials and between the overall graphics that you know that CBS used for the game. So if let's, you want to get into those now, let's, do it. let's save it post game and, and kind of wrap up with that because there's some pretty good stuff there. So okay, uh, let's we'll, we'll jump right into it and uh, talk about the game a little bit itself. So as I mentioned, this was a, a really good football game. Not just a good ending. 
I mean, you you take away the ending. If you erase the the Hail Mary altogether, Mike, I still think this football game stands on its own. And I mean, it's not one you're going to probably always think back to because, you know, there's a lot of games that end in the final minute. But the way this game was played back and forth between these two guys, these two quarterbacks, Kozar versus, uh, versus Flutie, I mean, this game by itself without that play is still a really solid uh, event. Yeah, the established veteran senior Flutie, who this was a, sort of a coronation game for him with the announcers pretty much all but giving him the Heisman Trophy, which he, w- he would eventually win um, uh, that next week. And he had the young up and comer Kozar, who was a sophomore in this game. And if this was the you know one of the first times people were seeing Bernie Kozar play in college back then, I mean they got a treat in this game because you could just tell uh, how good of an arm he had, and 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 he did have some interceptions in this game, but overall how accurate he was and how polished he was for such a young quarterback. Yeah. So let me give you a couple uh, a couple of names too. So. You know, coaches, you had Jimmy Johnson, obviously, then Jack Bignell on, on Boston College sideline, which don't really remember the name. He, he coached there until 1990. Uh, but you had those guys. Then the, the rosters itself. And a lot of times with these rosters, Mike, we go through them, and there's a ton of names that stand out in these games because they're usually between two really good teams. You know, they, they were their games on TV that we probably watched at this time. But when I went back and, and as they were showing the, the starting lineups, there were very few names that I recognized. And even though some of these guys went on to be pretty good pros, I mean, honestly, nobody jumped off the page to me besides the quarterbacks until the game started going and I heard the names a few more started coming back to me. But otherwise, like these rosters made up of guys that were never like superstars outside of those quarterbacks. Yeah, there were some great names in this game, like the kick returner named J.C. Penny. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. Has there ever been a guy who was – a sponsor in the game that had the same name as a player in the game. Yeah, that, there, he, that, yeah. So J.C. Penny was a sponsor, which was awesome. And then uh, Brent Musburger had a great line. I'm just waiting for somebody out here named Levi Strauss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love those mid '80s jokes. But also the Miami had a guy named Stanley Shakespeare, all time yep, name. Yep. I don't know if you noticed Bill Romanowski coming in for a time or two uh, for Boston College, right? And. The only other player of note in this game, and I only really made a note about him to look into him because they mentioned during the middle of the game, middle of the first quarter, actually, that the guy wanted to become a priest after he graduated from Boston College. Defensive lineman named Mike Ruth, who I looked into, what would go on in 1985 to win the Outland Trophy. Oh, wow. So when when you take those quarterbacks, Ruth and Romanowski, you know, obviously Miami had – some players that would go on to be very good college players in this game, like Melvin Bratton, who was very good in this game. Right. He would go on to be a pretty central part of what they would become. But yeah, outside of those two big names, uh, those two big names definitely are the ones that stick out though. Yeah. Eddie Brown, another good player in this game. Wide receiver had a really big game. Father then, of Antonio Brown, by the way. How about that? Boom. And, I didn't uh, realize that. I forgot to mention him. Thank you very much. I only know who Eddie Brown is because – I was the guy watching arena football, and he was an arena football legend. Was he? Wow. Yes. I didn't realize that. And see, I didn't realize it, but they talked about it during the game. You know, he might be the first wide receiver taken, and I was like, man, that's pretty high praise. He ended up being the NFL Rookie of the Year in 85, Um, but it was just weird. He was with Cincinnati, by the way, too. Uh, He wore the number 40, which was crazy. Like, there was a lot of weird numbers in this, uh, this era. And when Irvin was there, when Michael Irvin was there, you know, in the years to come, he was 47. So yeah. go figure. Who so knows? So wild. Other name of note, uh, just for for, uh, for laughs, offensive lineman for Miami uh, or for Boston College, Dave Heffernan. Love the yes. name Heffernan, right? Great Northeastern name and also King of Queens. So those are a few references. And, you know, Boston College did not have very many players. Know. You mentioned Romanowski. Didn't start in this game, but did make an appearance. Um, so... End of the game itself. So first quarter, Mike, we, we get right into it. Flutie starts off really, really well. We, we 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 see him go right down the field, first drive. And I think the good thing about Flutie, I think first thing I noticed, he did look a lot like Johnny Manziel. I think you can make those comparisons. Fair enough. He's able to scramble, get out of trouble, make some crazy throws, really keep a play alive. But what I was really impressed with by Flutie was his ability to make all types of throws. And I think he did this over the first couple of drives you saw it. I mean, you saw some some touch passes, uh, short passes that, that he was able to kind of loft over a defender, some long bullets down the middle of the field. I mean, he really had every throw. Yeah, first off, great comparison to Manziel. I have in my notes, comp Johnny Manziel. Yeah. And I think what they were both similar, what they did was, when they scrambled, they were always looking to throw. 
a lot of quarterbacks, right. especially from the 1980s, if they were running quarterbacks, mobile quarterbacks, that's what they did. They ran. But as far as Flutie in this game, you know, I thought the difference between Flutie in this game, and we saw it when he went, you know, 10 for 10 to start the game here, is when he got to the pros, they had to design offenses where he rolled out a lot because the players were bigger. But when he was in college, he was able to, like you said, make all the throws, whether it was screens, conventional dropbacks, rollouts, even one or two times in the shotgun. So like you said, just a, he showed the whole assortment of throws here early on. Yeah, he started off thing 11 for 11 total, but they went right down the field, score a touchdown, they get the ball right back, go right back down the field, score a touchdown again. All of a sudden it's 14 nothing. Boston College is just, just tearing up that Miami defense. But then Miami starts settling in a little bit there, and then you see Kozar kind of kind of get into his own. And I'll mention too, kind of quickly, a, a side note because there wasn't a, there was some atmosphere in this game, but the the crowd is is kind of what you would have expected for a Miami uh, in the old Orange Bowl, you know, with Miami not playing. For, I mean, they were really a good team. I mean, this is a top twelve matchup, but kind of a rainy weather day, day after Thanksgiving. I'd probably say what it was half, a little over half full. Yeah, the players, the uh, the people who did go, you know, uh, uh, received a treat in terms of a game. But yeah, yeah, typical. And this is coming from a guy who's followed Miami, you know, his whole life where he's been watching sports. So yeah. typical Orange Bowl crowd with nothing on the line, really. Yeah. So uh, my, uh, Miami comes down, does manage to score a touchdown. So it's fourteen seven after the first quarter. And both these guys, both these quarterbacks, I mean, this was all, all what we, we expected. Yeah, you know, this was the pregame conversation, these two guys going head-to-head. They had 200 yards, over 200 yards combined, right around 200 yards combined in the first quarter. So we got a taste of, okay, we might be in, in, in for a shootout in this game. And, and that's kind of how it set it up or set up early. And we were not let down at all. So into the second quarter, first turnover of the game was Flutie. Again, completion, kind of getting close to scoring, going in again. His guy fumbles. And, uh, and Miami takes over. But, I mean, until that point, Boston College was kind of doing what they wanted to. Yeah, this was a big turning point in the game. Like you said, my, uh, Miami showed signs of starting to come on. But after this turnover, Miami really put it into higher, a higher gear. Now, after this play, I mean, after this, this turnover, Miami did drive all the way back down the field. Then they fumbled as well. So they weren't able to put it away there. But uh, Kozar, as I mentioned, started getting it going. This game was back and forth. I mean, Kozar at one point in this second quarter had completed 11 straight passes like we saw Flutie do in the first quarter. So you're seeing both these guys at a high level early on in this game, which I think was, again, what I'm talking about when I said early on that I didn't ex- I didn't have high expectations for the game itself coming into it. But this was, I mean, this was a fun game to watch. These two guys were performing uh, as well as they could. Yeah, like you said, the, the, the throws they were making. Uh, you, I don't really equate 1984 college football with the kinds of throws they were making. And, and we have to talk about, too, the, the, the weather, you know, the types yeah. of weather conditions, windy, not only rainy, but windy as well, uh, made their performances even more special. It was 28-21 at halftime. Again, a, fi- a great final few minutes this this uh, first half, kind of back and forth. 660 yards of total offense in the first half. I mean, it was it was back and forth. And they would keep this pace, I mean, throughout. But that first half, really good. Any other notes on that first half, Mike? No, just and one, just one thing that Parsegian and Hayden were actually going back and forth about in the middle of the second quarter that I thought was eye-opening. And they were talking about how much better the quarterback play in college football had gotten the last 10 years. So I think Hayden, they mentioned it several times. I mean, that got annoying a little bit with Hayden and Parsegian going back and forth about Notre Dame and USC. Yeah, they love it. But then making note of like when Hayden played 10 years prior, how much better the quarterback play had gotten. And just sort of getting back to what we talked about before, just think about how much better the quarterback play got from there. It's one of those things where I know sports change over the years, but the way the game is played, it's this game was a little bit of a of a of a sort of foreshadowing on what was to come. Uh, But as a whole, uh, the way these guys played the game was a little bit of an outlier even back then. Yeah, those guys love talking about Notre Dame USC. That game was coming up, uh, I think that weekend maybe, but. Yeah, they, they were talking about past matchups and playing, just facing each other, all this stuff. Yeah, it was, that was a running story. Wait a minute, throughout. you don't know when the Notre Dame-USC game was in 1984? Because <laughs> I do. Hey, do you? <laughs> they, they, they previewed it. They pre- That's one common theme in these, in these CBS games that we seem oh. to find from back in the day. Uh, the next day, they were playing uh, Notre Dame and USC, and I believe it was a 3.30 kick. Hey, I'm not sure if you knew that uh, as well, but that Saturday was also – the season premiere for CBS College Basketball, Indiana and Louisville were playing as well. 
Yeah, you got you will get these jokes that we're making right now when you go back and watch the games. They previewed the Indiana, Louisville, and the USC Notre Dame games. Probably Ben, I don't think we're and they and they went to the sites of the games for previews at halftime also. Yeah, coach interviews. But they probably preview with the graphics, probably I would say fifteen times is not yeah, combined, yeah. Stretching it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was it was uh, uh, at least twice a quarter, it seemed like. Um, but anyway, into the third quarter. So it's 28-21 at halftime. Again, high-scoring game. Miami, right out of the gate. She had J.C. Penny <laughs> receiving the opening kickoff in the second half. Fumbles it out of bounds at his own four. Okay, boneheaded play. Miami goes nine plays, 96 yards, in under four minutes, too, by the way. A really quick drive. And kind of set the tone for the second quarter, uh, for the second half, third quarter, and they got off to a great start. But you kind of had that sense of like, okay, Miami's they're kind of trekking back. I mean, that drive was was a statement. Yeah, for sure. This is like I know this sound. This might sound strange, but when you go back and watch these games, like me and Ben do, even though you 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 may not know play by play what's going to happen, you know what's going to happen at the end most of the time. And there's but there's still always a moment in the game where you perk up in your seat and you say, well, we got a ball game now. And when they went nine plays, 96 yards, and tied the game, that was that moment for this game. Yeah, it was. And and uh, Miami had another chance again to, to take a take their first lead of the game. They've been trailing the entire time. Uh, they drive, drive down the field again. They're in inside the red zone. Big third down play. They throw the ball. And by the way, Parsegian was was on. Like He made a lot of these calls along the way, uh, and Hayden too. But these guys were pretty spot on in terms of kind of predicting and and uh, anticipating what was coming. Again, they I think they called for, hey, this is probably a pass situation. Kozar has a guy wide open in the end zone. Throws it behind him. It's off his hands. A chance to go up uh, by seven. Instead, they settle for just, a, a I think, a 19-yard field goal to go up 31-28. But I thought that was a big turning point. For sure. And are you saying that um, Tony Romo is basically imitating Arab Parsegian? Essentially, yeah. Place? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, And so some other notes I made about this third quarter. This is the first time we saw the Boston College punter who was a backup quarterback. <laughs> nice. I don't know if you caught that. He was number seven, and they said he was going to be the guy who was going to take over for Flutie. Don't <laughs> see that much. And also, what I began to notice in this quarter was the BC head coach signaling in the formations to Flutie. Yeah. Did you notice that? Uh, not really. He was making all these bizarre gestures. You know, he was like flapping his arms like an eagle. You right. know what I mean? Like yeah. just to get the formations into Flutie, I thought that was pretty funny. But yeah, at the end of three, it's 31-31. And, you know, it sets us up for what would be a, a legendary fourth quarter. Yeah, and both teams had missed opportunities. I mentioned that that missed uh, touchdown by Kozar Flutie. Also, they, they go down again. They make a good drive, but Miami's defense stood up. They had to settle for a field goal as well in that quarter to make it 31-31. So both teams had opportunities there to uh, – to get it done, but I thought another big play in this this one was Kozar uh, had another uh, interception this quarter. He, he made a couple of mistakes that that touchdown that was missed, plus this interception. You know they weren't huge mistakes, but in a game like this, I thought they were pretty pretty critical here in the third quarter. But it's still still tied up, thirty one thirty one going to the fourth, and early on in this one, you see a, a huge play. Kozar gets a third and twenty one, third and twenty one completion, but then kind of turns right around and throws an interception next play. Yep, I have in my notes, great throw by Kozar, comma, great interception by BC. They were both really they were both really good plays. Also, we had our first sack early on in the fourth quarter in the game. You know what happened? Yeah. I said to myself, is that the first sack of the game? And then the announcer right away said, the first sack of the game. So, you know, you have, you know, a very uh, key interception by BC that leads to them marching down the field, kicking a field goal, and taking a 34-31 lead. You had two really good plays in this quarter as well for Miami. So Brown, Eddie Brown makes a great catch along, kind of along the sidelines. This is an error too, okay, when when the wide receivers start of their stance kind of in a runner, a sprinter stance with their you know, three-point stance on the outside, okay? You don't ever see that anymore. He wasn't wearing gloves, okay? You know, we see guys now that have these gloves that essentially, I'm not saying they catch the ball for you, but they, they, they do a lot in terms of helping you uh, reel in a catch. He didn't have any gloves. It's wet. He goes out, kind of like a hitch route, slips, able to stand back up. The throw's kind of away from him. He's kind of diving towards the sideline, makes this this catch in his bare hands uh, with his hands only. I mean, he's stretched out completely. Beautiful catch. Next play, Melvin Bratton 
breaks one down the sideline, cuts through a few defenders all the way across the field, scores in two plays. They make two humongous plays, 52-yard touchdown run, gives them a lead 38-34. Yeah, Miami goes up 38-34, and you have BC literally right back down, right? Scores a touchdown. Musburger says at that point that this may be the two best passing attacks in the history of the game. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we were. That's in 1984. So if you go back to 1984 and you're watching this game, that's the level of passing attacks that these two teams were. So a couple of things in this fourth quarter, too, that I noticed. Did you notice coming back from a commercial about midway through the quarter? You know, again, so another thing that's part of this experience of watching these old games, you don't get the score, obviously, rarely. But there was very few times we even knew what what was left on the game clock. I mean, they, they wouldn't even show it going in and out of breaks. It was probably referenced a couple times a quarter. I mean, not even after touchdowns. So many times I'm lost during this game. Like, are we close in the quarter? What's our situation right now? But did you notice coming back from a commercial, they 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 shoot the the game clock and it's ticking, like it was already running before they snapped the play coming back from break. Did you did you see that? Am I crazy? I did. I did catch that. And and we talked about this several times with these games where. This game was was the worst one we've watched, maybe because I think it's one of the older games we watched where they would actually show a picture of the actual game in stadium scoreboard to show <laughs> how much time was left. <laughs> the other games we've done from the from the late 80s, 90s, that time period, they at least had the bug. They just rarely showed it. Yeah. And it does make it hard to follow the game at some points. Brutal. Anyway, I'm not sure what that was all about, but it happened. The final four, three or four minutes in this game were really awesome, too. If you're going to have to skip ahead, I mean, don't just go straight to the Hail Mary. Watch the entire, like, final five or six minutes. You know, after Boston College Boston College took that lead with less than four minutes left, looked to be in pretty good shape. Then Miami goes on a really good drive. I mean, this was this was a, this was was a an ideal two minute. I mean, not even really two minutes, a little bit longer. But they milked all the clock that they needed to, right? It was about a little over, you know, a little under four minutes. They basically were backed up to, you know, inside their 15-yard line. I mean, earlier in this, the very beginning of this drive, Kozar scrambling out of his own end zone. They meticulously drive down the field, uh, perfect play calling. They get to the, the down inside the five. Kozar has a conversation with Jimmy Johnson and his coaching staff, and they're talking about he. Kozar even says, "I want to run it right at him." I mean, they make that observation based on the conversation they have on the sideline, and that's exactly what happens. They hand it all, hand the ball off to Bratton right up the middle. He dives in. He's untouched. Really, there's an entire you know, wide open gap that he can just kind of walk through. He dives in anyway. And they take the lead. 28 seconds left. And that seemed like they got it done. I mean, that was executed precisely. And there was not, I mean, at that point, you're thinking this thing's over. Great drive by Miami. Miami goes in 45-41. In the air tonight is playing on the on the speakers at the <laughs> Orange Bowl. It's, you know, nighttime's descending on South Florida. And it's the most 1980s. Miami moment you could imagine with these fans celebrating in the air tonight playing the Miami Hurricanes about to win a game at the Orange Bowl everyone's on cloud nine even Jimmy Johnson was even kind of uh not celebrating but you could see he was smiling enjoying himself right there so final drive here we go Doug Flutie the Hell Mary so they get the ball it was a touchback they bring it out 20 yard completion first play second play pass for about 13 yards to get him over the 50. Then they had huge the, play. Huge play. Huge play. Had to get there. Um, the next play, Flutie has a guy. It's off his hands. Incompletion. Would have got him down to about the 30-yard line. So at this point, six six seconds left. They're talking about it. Hey, you got to throw to the end zone here. Uh, another good observation. I mean, pr- pretty obvious, but still, you know, this day and age, you can easily see a guy, and they had a timeout left, Throw, try to throw a quick pass, call a timeout, get a few more yards. But the ball's still at the 48-yard line. They shoot. They get a shot of Kozar on the sideline. His teammates are patting him on the back. He's yeah. got the towel around the neck. He's feeling good. He's thinking about going out in Miami, mid-80s. Yeah. Like, he's <laughs> feeling it right now, right? They're all celebrating on the sidelines, man. And they actually, like you said, they had the camera right behind Kozar and his teammates celebrating. Yeah, it was beautiful. So, right after that, you get to play. And, again, a little bit of context on this play. Starts at the 48-yard line. He has to scramble out. We see him kind of avert a sack and uh, get his feet under him. He lets the ball go 36 or 37 yard line, his own 36 or 37. And again, this ball and in uh, and the, and the legend now after the fact is he threw the ball into 30 mile an hour wind. I don't know how, how much when they have, but I will say 
in defense of that 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 legend. You go back to the the kickoff to start this drive. Parsegian does say they got the window of their back on that 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 kickoff because they were asking, do you squib it here? Do you give a return? And he says, no. You go ahead. I think you just go ahead and kick it deep. You got the wind to your back, and of course it, it went through the end zone for a touchback. So. That, that was legit. There was legit wind in his face. This guy's throwing it from his own 36-yard line, Mike. I mean, one, one of the most incredible throws, the play was set up, I think, for his roommate, who had, again, another incredible game in this one, feeling. And the play was set up for him to, to tip it with two guys around him, and hopefully they caught it. He gets behind the defense, we saw. Ball gets over the two Miami defenders, drops in for a touchdown. It's only officially a 48-yard touchdown pass. But one of the most incredible throws uh, we've seen in college football. Great job breaking down how the wind uh, was a factor that that Flutie overcame with this throw as well. And it was an absolute dart. I mean, usually these these hail mary throws are you know these these high high balls yeah. that are like you said the plan is to tip them around. Uh, how I mean the other side of this? How does Miami let that one guy get behind everyone? Yeah, it, I mean this is a for those of you who either don't remember it or you're going to go back and watch it. This is a clean play. The ball wasn't tipped by anyone. The ball wasn't anything. Uh, he, this guy just, uh, Gerard Fallon, just got behind the defense. And, man, those Miami, those players in the Miami secondary, uh, you know, the amount of times they've probably seen this play and shaking their heads, I can't even imagine. Well, I would imagine this probably, like, because you said it was a dart. I think he had to throw it like that. You had, I mean, the only way you get it to the end zone like that is to, wind, is to yeah. cut through the wind, right? I mean, and he yeah. did it. Good I, mean, point. I, Good I don't point. think many guys could make that throw. Um, and if he does loft it up, I think it gets knocked down easily. And I, and probably the guys, you know, uh, kind of because it was a quick pass. I mean, he got there in just a couple sec, a few seconds. It felt like they probably didn't have time to react. I mean, the guy's sixty yards away from you, Mike. You know what I mean? Like it's not like he was the fifty, and you know he's going to get it there. There's probably some sense like, okay, I don't know, he's even going to get it to the end zone, and it just happened so quick and got there uh, for that touchdown. Great call by by Musburger there, and his uh, his roommate ends up with. 11 catches, 220. Meanwhile, Brown on the other side had 200, over 220 yards receiving as well. So you had two guys with over 220 yards here. Um, of course, these both these quarterbacks, huge days. Kozar, 447 yards, went 25 uh, of 38. Flutie, 34 of 46 for 472. And uh, a couple of touchdowns through the air, one on the ground. Really just a remarkable performance all across the board. And and having that Hail Mary, I mean, I think this game ranks up there as one of the best college football games of all time, especially if you take out, you know, in the playoff games, if you say, okay, regular season games, this could arguably be one of the best regular season games ever. Uh, for sure. Because, like, you know, while I obviously didn't see this game live when it happened, I've watched a lot of college football since then. And there's very few regular season games where you can match great play during the game with a great ending at the end of the game. And I think this game checked those boxes. I thought it was awesome Flutie after the game as well. Um, after the game now, you know, post game with his helmet off. He looks exactly the same, by the way, yeah. <laughs> uh, now as he did in 1984. But he's asking, you could see him on the field asking, where's Bernie, where's Bernie, wanting to congratulate Kozar, sort of having the presence of mind in the moment that, wow, this was a great game. And you can see the Miami fans – uh, I'm sorry, the Miami players talking to Flutie on the field, like sort of laughing about the game and, and just sort of like even reminiscing on the field, like, man, that was a hell of a game and that was a heck of a throw. Uh, yeah. I thought that was a cool moment as well. Yeah, it really was. So they finished combined, both these teams, 1,273 total yards of offense. Uh, really remarkable game altogether. So you wrap it up. Flutie goes on, wins the Heisman. Kozar was a finalist this year too. He ends up finishing fourth in the voting and uh, really just a remarkable game all the way. Some Just some some overall uh, takeaways, Mike. Flutie, I mean, I, I, I see why Flutie is kind of talked about the way he is and kind of remembered for, for what he did. We, we got this. I don't know how much you watched. I mean, this was obviously when we were very, very young. So I don't know how much you actually remember of even playing college. I don't, probably, you probably don't. But we remember him a little bit more in the NFL, and he was able to do a few things and had some pretty good moments in the NFL. But <clears throat> we don't think of him as that – you know, remarkable player, but everybody talks about this guy. But you watch this game and you, you really get a true understanding of what Flutie was all about in college. Yeah, he's, you know, sometimes it's, it's good enough and it's great to be a really good college player. 
And I think people sometimes get too caught up in how the guy's going to translate to the pros and what kind of pro is he going to be instead of enjoying what's right in front of you. I think we were guilty of that with Manziel, who we mentioned before, and Flutie as well. I mean, Flutie, look, credit to Flutie. The way he played the game never changed after he got out of college. I mean, the highlights of him, whether it be in the Canadian League or or in the NFL, um, he played his style. And if you appreciated it and you wanted to play him, great. If not, he was unapologetic about it. And th- and I respect that about Doug Flutie. Yeah, he's still like a New England legend, isn't he? Oh, of course. Dude, he's BC football. Yeah. BC football was – was they even went into it during this game. He he He's still the most popular athlete ever from BC. I don't think it's even arguable. Yeah, and he would go on to play a little bit with the Patriots and had that – what, that drop kick extra point, right? <laughs> yeah, the drop kick extra point. He had the – the year with the Bills where he pretty much yeah. salvaged their season. And then uh, for the playoff game, they started Rob Johnson instead of Doug Flutie. Yeah, ridiculous. But yeah, one of the most decorated athletes, college athletes of all time. And uh, his number is retired there. Bernie, Bernie Kozar obviously went on, uh, had a, a really good NFL career. Definitely the best NFL career out of anybody on the field for this game. Jimmy Johnson, you saw what he's done. I mean, this was his very first year in Miami. Still a bit of an unknown. I mean, a little bit at this time, but we saw what he was able to accomplish after, you know, it only took him a couple of years and he was, uh, he had that team uh, becoming the U, essentially. He t- he kind of really tra- transformed that that program. It was still a really good program at the time, but what he was able to do with that program and turned into what it became in the late 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s all kind of started right here with uh, with this group. I thought another interesting note of players, kind of what they went on, you, you referenced a couple. Melvin Bratton, and I and I heard his name a few times. And I was trying to remember, like, is it because of what he, you know, who he was on the field? Because he played a little bit, right? I mean, I think he he was in the NFL for a little while, uh, went on. But you know, the reason why I, I had heard his name, Mike, and you know, we also we often talk about going back to the Alabama connection that I have. But do you know do you do you know where I'm going with this at all with the connection to Alabama? I don't. I know he had a very serious injury, Melvin Brad, didn't he? Or no, am I off on that? No, he did. He had a very serious okay. knee injury in the 90, in an 87 National Championship game, which they think cost him a ton of money in the NFL because his draft status dropped down quite a bit. But he actually held the record uh, at the end of his career for career touchdowns at 33 at Miami. So really good player. But that's not it. He went on to become an agent, and I think he's currently an agent. But he was the guy in 2008 – when Alabama went undefeated regular season, lost to uh, Florida in the SEC championship game, Saban's second year, went down to the Sugar Bowl to play Utah. Before that Utah game, Andre Smith, Alabama's best player at the time, offensive lineman, offensive tackle, played in the NFL for a long time, ended up missing that game because of contact with an agent. That agent was Melvin Bratton. Ooh, sneaky Melvin Bratton, ruining the... Utah, Alabama, <laughs> Sugar Bowl for you. Alabama would go on to lose that game uh, quite handily by Utah. Um, but I, just to, forget, people forget Andre Smith. I don't think he was as good a, of a pro as people maybe expected because of how good he was in college. Yeah, but I mean, he played. He he's still on. He's the Ravens he's roster, playing. which is he's crazy. Still playing, right? Yeah, yeah over yeah. ten years, he's Allen Trophy winner, uh, All American. So yeah, but I thought that was an interesting note. That's where I remember his name from. I just could not place it. Uh, but that's what it was. So let's get into some outdated, Mike, before we wrap it up. I got a long list. Um, I'll let you start with something. Okay. Are we going to trade back and forth here, or am I yeah, going to empty yeah, out my list here? Just keep going, and I'll, I'll interject. Okay. The commercials. Just some of the sponsors, right, Yeah. that I saw throughout these commercials. Radio Shack. All of these And all these commercials had jingles, by the way, which yeah. is an 80s thing. Jingles in Ra- like a 40-year-old white male was in like yeah, every single yeah, commercial. Yeah, exactly. Radio Shack, Domino's, Mr. Goodwrench. <laughs> yeah. New Volkswagen Jet is on sale for seven thousand dollars. <laughs> was it seventy nine ninety five? Yeah. And Michelob Light. Dude, how about all the army ads? I was shocked at how many um armed forces ads. Like Army was essentially probably eight or nine army ads. Be all that you can be jingle that I don't know if you haven't heard it. It's all I can remember when I think Army uh growing up in that decade that era. And the Navy had a bunch too. Yeah, there was a lot of you know that's a, that's a good point. You do see armed for you know uh, armed forces uh, ads now, but not as much as back then. Good point. Uh, one one commercial that I like. You mentioned Radio Shack. I was sho- shocked that they. So this is a, an era, interesting era, time period for technology. Technology is really kind kind of taking over. You kind of start seeing the computer era. Radio Shack had a, a commercial for the Tandy Two Thousand. 
And it was a personal computer. I guess this was kind of around the time of the battle with Apple, right? As Apple was kind of launching their their big run, right? They had their big 1984 Super Bowl commercial that still gets played and talked about today. The Tandy 2000, this guy was pimping this thing like it was the next great thing, the best personal computer you can own. It's, it's sold exclusively at Radio Shack. And I didn't remember this thing at all, but obviously these guys lost out huge to Apple. But that computer ad cracked me up. And the other technology too, you had a great Sony ad for a CD player, okay? Which really was starting to kind of happen at this time, CDs. They, they first started off with the, C, you know, the CD player that you could play at your house. But Sony had created one that you can put in your car and also a portable CD player that you can carry with you. Mind blown. <laughs> when you and think about it, CDs had a pretty good run. Not a bad the run. Mid-80s. Not a bad run. Mid-80s but 80s to the 2000... I mean, yeah. 2010? Probably about there, yeah. Probably about there. The yeah, other thing... So had, they were money makers for the studios because I think they were really cheap to make. Oh, and they you pay paying easily 15, 20 bucks a pop. Um, and the other outdated technology, VHS tapes. Kodak had a nice ad for VHS tapes recording some great moments uh, on that as well. So I'll, I'd love to see a kid from that was born after 2000 go back and watch this game and sit through all the commercials and get their reaction. They're probably that's like, that's part of the best. No that's clue. part of the, 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 the charm, if you will, of going back and watching these games for sure. All right. Another outdated. All the TV shows they're promoting. My mom watched a lot of these shows. My parents watched a lot of these shows because so I was aware of them. But you had coming up next after the show. So this is a Friday night, thanks, the day after Thanksgiving. Usually we see football all night now. But they had like a lineup, full lineup of shows led off by the Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> Did you see I, that? Yeah, I, I saw that. I never watched that show. You never watched before, it. Before my time, as they say. Yeah, well, we growing up in the South, we watched it a few times. Yeah. <laughs> um, how it was about, like cheers. It was like cheers. Or <laughs> yeah, cheers for you. Um, I thought very interesting, too, on this more of kind of a more serious note, Cagney and Lacey, they had another, you know, kind of detective show, cop show, a lot of cop dramas this era. They had an episode they were promoting on pr- police brutality, like self was it self-defense or not. And I thought, wow, this is pretty wild. I mean, almost 40 years later, we're having the same conversations that they were having. Uh, and that was probably a big deal in 1984 to have those conversations uh, in, in TV like that. I thought that was pretty crazy. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I noticed some of the graphics that CBS used. Okay. Yeah. This is literally what a graphic was. It was Bernie Kozar. It was pre, it was a pregame. It was Bernie Kozar and a graphic that said word for word under him. Bernie Kozar has 23 touchdowns and 14 interceptions. <laughs> That's what the graphic said word for word. <laughs> Yeah, they weren't, uh, the graphics weren't very, uh, very sophisticated at that point, for sure. Right after they showed his stats that said 23 TD, 14 INT. <laughs> oh, wow. They had a lot of football promotion, obviously, NFL happening right now. St. Louis Cardinals were still a franchise at that point. So yep. it kind of took me back. I, that seemed much older than, than that, but that was the case. But the other, the, the one other outdated uh, for me in terms of football was and this happens now you don't see this at all but these this is a period and you you talked about it teams teams were accepting bowl bids in November so Wild. you you had you had yeah. Boston College already ready for the Cotton Bowl there was conversations about if this team can win X game they might go to this they might get the invitation to this bowl game now it's a big TV show right I mean it's Sunday it's Sunday you get the 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 playoff reveal then you have all the bowl announcements and where everybody's going back then it was like a legit deal where like the orange bowl representatives would show up at your game to scout you and then you would get an invitation at some point in the year you could accept it you're like you know you're playing your last two or three games of the season already knowing what your post game postseason looks like not only that but you have these announcers literally saying oh doug flutie is going to win the heisman next week like th- these days even when the heisman winner may be a foregone conclusion they're the not drama. openly talking about it and saying, oh, yeah, Doug, you know, uh, this guy's definitely going to win. Or these, like you said, these teams are definitely playing in this bowl game. You know, they keep things a little bit closer to the vest to create a little bit more drama to sell TV shows. Yeah, exactly. Any other outdated items, Mike? That's all I have. That's all I have as well. So let's wrap it up on that note. Great episode. Really enjoyed this game. Any closing thoughts on this matchup? 1984 Miami Boston College. Yeah, it leaves me one. This watching this game leaves me wondering what happened in that Louisville Indiana game. <laughs> I know, back. but all, all seriousness, great game, exceeded expectations. 
Make sure to go watch it uh, on our on our website, distantreplay.com. Uh, yeah, distantreplaypodcast.com. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> distantreplaypodcast.com because the, we have the on, on there. We're going to have the only copy of that game from YouTube. So this is not a game that's widely um, available on YouTube. It's the only one I could find. Yeah, shout out to a uh, Florida State fan. Apparently, Garnet Garnet and Gold is his, his username on YouTube. Has this game up there of all places. So, uh, yeah, I, for me, I've kind of already said it. Just it exceeded my expectations. I went into it thinking kind of have to sit through a game that you know whatever to see this final play. But the game itself was really good, and without the the Hail Mary, still would have been a classic football game between two really good quarterbacks. But that that Hail Mary kind of elevated it to the conversation of maybe one of the best regular season games of all time. So a lot of fun. Make sure you get subscribe. We appreciate all the new subscribers we've gotten over the last few weeks. Uh, we will probably hit another documentary up pretty soon coming up. So we'll do a little mix of documentary recaps and games like this, but got a long list ahead of us. So hit subscribe, YouTube, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen. Uh, we'll have this game up on our website, distantreplaypodcast.com. And uh, we'll look forward to having another conversation. Mike, enjoy this one. Same here, Benny. Until next time.